we're going to do a little bit of like a real quick toning right now just to set a little bit of a consciousness, um, some opening. And then we're going to do a little bit more in the meditation, which is not right at the end of the talk. Isn't there something in the middle? I can't remember. Well, we'll just do it right at the end of the talk then. But um, I'm going to do something that uh, I'm not supposed to do, which <laughs> everybody that knows me is like, uh, we're going to mix two different languages together. Um, there's a sound that we know of, uh, that sound Christ, in, in the word Christ in Greek is Christos. What we're going to do is we're going to take part of that word Christ, which is that higher light, the higher essence. We're going to blend that with an Aramaic sound, Aya, A-Y-A, Aya. Um, <clears throat> Christos, Kri, Christ is that higher light. Aya, that's in the Greek. In Aramaic, the Aya sound means something that has no beginning and no ending. It's at the end of the word Shemaya. Now, the word that Yeshua used for heaven was Shemaya, which also meant, guess what, sky. If you want to know how heaven became located in the sky, it's because in his language, it was the same word. And he was using common words to take these really deep, profound, mystic experiences and put them down into the common language. So the sound that we're going to make is Christia, which is not a word. Um, but for me, it's been a very, very powerful word that I've been... And you know what? English is such a hodgepodge of so many languages. I don't see... The, the lines are so blurred at this point anyway. But if we were to take... Okay, if we were to take these two different languages, these two different words, and put them together, we're basically looking at that higher light essence that is limitless, that is everywhere. It's also at the end of the word yechidaya, which was the one translated in Greek as monogenes, which was only begotten. But in Yeshua's language, in Aramaic, the word yechidaya, the aya sound at the end, means limitless. Not begotten, but rather one who is completely limitless in consciousness, wide open. So the sound we're going to make is kristaya. Okay, I'll do it the first time, and then I'm going to have you do it with me just three times, and then we're going to rest in silence for just a few moments after that, okay? So the sound is Christaya. I'll do it once, and then you'll do it with me three times. Let go of any worry about your voice or being in tone or, you know, being uh, in tune or harmony or anything like that. This doesn't have to be Manhattan transfer this time. Next time, but not this time. Christa Okay, now put everything you have in this. Bring everything you have into this. We'll do it three times together. Christa that higher light, that absolutely limitless higher light, no beginning, no ending. Keep that in your consciousness. We have two more. Christa. Christa. open your eyes. <clears throat> this text behind me is the beginning of the Gospel of John in Aramaic. If you see that red space in the middle, right after that you'll see, well, you won't see, but I'll see. Bereshit etawi hua milta, wahal milta, etawi hua loet laha, wahlaha etawi wa hal milta. In the beginning was the, the word. That word, word, um, is milta, which doesn't actually just mean a word on a page. That ta genders that feminine. What that means is this. As an example, my feminine perception of the pole that is right in the middle of the space here. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, <clears throat> actually, last time I was here, uh, someone made a joke about pole dancing the day before, and it accidentally came out of my mouth during the service. 
So, anywho, you don't actually sell those, do you? The services? <laughs> okay. Um, or even record. My perception of the pole is feminine. The pole itself is masculine. Okay? Perception uh, in terms of language, uh, if I'm seeing something or having an experience of something, my experience in terms of language, linguistics, is feminine. The thing that I'm experiencing, the thing that I'm looking at is masculine. Here's an Aramaic Bible. My perception of the Bible is feminine. The Bible itself is masculine. Okay, is that clear? I'll talk more about that in a toning circle, and then I'll open this up, and let's say that I'm looking at the beginning of the Gospel of John. My pers- this says, in the beginning was the feminine word. My perception of that, of the words, my perception of those words is feminine. The w- written word itself is masculine. In the beginning was not a written word, in the beginning was a spoken word. Or, in other words, my, my experience of speaking of that vibration moving through me is feminine. What you're hearing, that sound is masculine. Your perception is feminine. If I'm twisting your mind, that's okay. Uh, it's okay to not quite understand what I'm saying. The point that I'm saying is this, though. <clears throat> We've mistakenly turned a lot of very feminine ideas and the teachings of Yeshua Jesus and made them masculine. Rather than states of being and experience and directly experiential, we turn them into don't do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, say this, don't say that, which is basically almost the completely opposite of everything that he was trying to put out in Aramaic. And what happens is when we take something that's an essence, an essence idea, and we make it a masculine thing of do this and don't do that about action as opposed to the state of being that precedes action, we flip its meaning, in some cases opposite, or make it basically pull it completely out of what it was originally intended to mean. Um, Now, we've got this really amazing thing happening in the next few weeks. Uh, Not that anybody's noticed or seen it on the news or in the movies. or. um, Now, I'm going to talk about someone. And now we're in, in talking about Yeshua, which is basically the core of what I do, um, I do a lot of study. And I've been deep in study of these types of things for longer than I've been working with the Aramaic language, going all the way back to when I was seven and eight years old. I was not a normal kid. Um, and there's a lot of things that are, that are starting to move around now in the press and in books, and people are making it into conspiracy theories and all these kinds of things. Uh, They're not if you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Now, what I want to do first is lay a base of, um, and I'm very aware of the time. Uh, (laughs) No, I know you're not. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I love Margaret and David. They're great. I never see you two, though. You're never here when I'm here. It's always your excuse to leave town. So, (laughs) Oh, I say that in love. See, you took it the wrong way. You took it masculine instead of feminine. (laughs) Um, So I just want to lay a base of who it is we're talking about first. So we're talking about Jesus. He lived in the first century of the common era. Okay, that we know that is A.D. here in the West. Prior to his birth, an angel told his mother that her son would be divine. Miraculous signs and wonders accompanied his birth. He was gifted in religious theology as a child. He left home in adulthood to begin his ministry, teaching the good news that we should live for spiritual rather than earthly riches. Anybody know what good news, that word gospel, it means good news, right? It actually comes from the Anglo-Saxon and it means God's spell. Cool, huh? It's a play. (laughs) So that's the the whole thing about the the gospels. They're about Broadway. He... (laughs) Spiritual rather than earthly riches, he formed a core of disciples and performed miracles. He irritated the religious figures of the day uh, who had charges brought against him by the Roman authorities. After his death, his followers affirmed that he had ascended to heaven and that they had seen him alive afterwards. So who are we talking about? I'm talking about Apollonius of Tyana. Hmm. Let me give you another little story here. Horus. Sun god of Egypt, also known as Ra, 3000 BC, born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis Mary, a star in the east during his birth. Three kings followed that star to find the newborn savior. 
He was incredibly gifted as a spiritual teacher at the age of 12. At 30, just a coincidence, he was baptized by Anna, coincidence, which began his public ministry. He traveled with how many disciples? 12. It's just a coincidence. He performed miracles including walking on water and healing the sick. He was betrayed by Typhon, coincidence, was crucified, buried for how many days? Three, and resurrected. He was known as the truth, the light of the world, the anointed son of God, the lamb, and the good shepherd. And this is basically the same backstory as Osiris. This is basically the same backstory as Atis. This is basically the same backstory as Mithra. This is a lot of similar uh, story as Krishna, um, a lot of similar story as Dionysus. Now, a lot of people are going to make things like this into conspiracy theories. Some people get thrown for a, a tailspin, which I can understand. Um, and I'm with you on that. In that when I first heard these, it's got to be 20 years ago, a phenomenal book called uh, The Jesus Mysteries from Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy that came out about, oh, 13 years ago. Um, is when I really dove deep into all of this. Anybody's ever seen the Zeitgeist film? But, hmm, let's talk about Christmas a little bit here. And remember what I, and while I'm doing this, I want you to keep in mind that sound Christos or Christia, that highest light consciousness that is limitless, that is everywhere. If it's limitless, that means that it's either everywhere or it's nowhere. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay, and that includes heaven. Heaven is either everywhere or heaven is nowhere. A phenomenal book from David Alexander that just came out about heaven being real, a doctor, and I believe he was a neurologist, neurosurgeon. neurosurgeon. Amazing. And I saw your little article down there and had Charlene copy it for me yesterday. So, so, um, but not in color. Um, she just copied it in black and white. And I asked for color. No. So, here we go. Three kings follow the birth. They fought, well, they follow the star in the east to, no, to locate the newborn Savior. First of all, on December 21st, we have sort, sort of a day, a couple of us have probably heard in the room, heard about, especially this particular one coming up in about two weeks, um, which is that win, the winter solstice, of course. An interesting thing happens, first of all, that the sun moves down into the region of what's called in the sky the southern crux or cross. And it drops down right at the time of the solstice and appears to stop moving for three days. It dies in the region of the crux, the cross. It's dead for three days. And on December 25th, late on the 24th, it begins to be born and rise perceivably one degree north. Okay? Now, first of all, the, this right here, the three kings of Orion's belt will actually organize themselves early on the 25th and line up with Sirius, the star in the east, to, of course, locate the newborn sun, S-U-N. And it's been like this far earlier than humans were ever recording anything. And one of the things that a lot of people are going to want to do is they're going to want to jump and say, oh, well, the whole thing is a lie. If there's any reason that I'm here on earth right now, it's to say, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If, if you want to say that a myth is something that's not important, then maybe you want to try a little bit of the study of Joseph Campbell's work. Or if you want to know that myth and archetypes aren't important, maybe you can you know, tell a Jungian psychologist or look into the work of Carl Jung and tell him that archetypes and myth isn't important. It's all connected together. What we're doing is we're taking something that's a feminine essence. The, in, the implicate is the explicate. The inner experience for us is the astronomical and the astrological experience. How many teaching at the age of 12? How many disciples? 12. How many tribes of Judah? 12. Hmm. That's the zodiac. And look what's in the middle. The sun is in the middle, and the sun is where? On the cross. And of course, on December 25th, as the sun is reborn, 
the resurrection, of course, there's the death at the winter solstice and is reborn with what? A crown of thorns, that resurrection. The crown of thorns had to be put into the story. And of course, what's the crown of thorns? Look at the sun when it's coming up in the morning. Stare at it long enough, you'll find out what the crown of thorn is, thorns is. Interesting. It also, hmm, look at that. Amazing. Now, as we're, of course, traveling about 2,150 years to each astrological age, one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life is people saying, I don't believe in astrology. I read the Bible. <laughs> my, even when I'm a kid, I'm like, have you ever read it? Have you ever actually read what Jesus said? And it's funny, I, I, it's hard not to laugh at like the, uh, I love like the, the Christian fish symbol, and it says Jesus inside, which of course is a pagan astrological symbol of Pisces. <laughs> I get a kick out of things like that. But um, of course, we've got one of the Mayan calendars. It's amazing how what's happening right now is not just some Christian thing. It's not just astrology. It's not just astronomy. Is it just coincidence that when the Higgs boson collider over in Europe that they're like this close to finding possibly the most important scientific find that has ever been found in the history of humankind? Do you think that's just by chance? Or maybe it is completely by chance, but what's happening is the way I liken it is almost like an evolutionary moment of truth, the evolutionary moment of truth. What do I mean by that? You know how, as an example, in mechanics, in a car, in physics, there's the law of entropy. And let's say you've got a car running at 130 miles an hour, 130 miles an hour, 130 miles an hour, and you keep it going, going, going. And then you're like, I want to step it up to 150, okay? And you start moving it up to 150, and things start, you know, and you kind of pull back to 130 again. Does it sound like your life? I want, I want to move into a higher vibration. And then you start moving into a higher vibration, and it's going, it's like, whoa, okay, pull back, pull back, pull back. Willingness is the cosmic grease, in the words of, of Michael Rice. There's a, a, a quote when Yeshua says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, liba, all of your mind, reyanach, all of your soul, napsha, all of your strength, hylach in Aramaic. Hylach doesn't mean strength and what he's saying there, such as holding on with all of your strength, that's masculine. What he's saying there is basically a willingness to let your own strength fall, let your own strength go so that strength itself can birth through you. And if there's ever been a time for you to do that, it would be right here, right now. Because the world's going to end in two weeks. <laughs> it's all going down in brimstone and fire. Yes, finally. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to cut my hair like Donald Trump and fire people. <laughs> I don't know if my hair would even go in that sort of the, the, the Trumpiness. Um, Trumpiness. <laughs> Trumpiness, new word. I've had two new words today, Christaya and Trumpiness. Um, <laughs> but here, here's my point. First of all, apocalypse. It's the apocalypse. Anybody know what apocalypse means? Yeah. Apocalypsis is the word in Greek, which means... Unveiling or lifting of the veil. Oh, huh. I thought it was like, you know, just like dying and my fingernails getting ripped out one by one and like nose hairs being pulled by Satan. That's what I thought it was. That's one of the drawbacks of getting older. You start getting nose hair. But um, look, come on, be serious. Uh, Armageddon's another interesting one, Armageddon, Armageddon, which actually implies, it, it refers to a specific region when speaking in Hebrew, that Greek meanings is the lifting of the veil at the end of time. When's the end of time? Yeshua said in Matthew 28, 20, according to what's written, I am with you even unto the end of time, unto the end of the world, unto the end of the age. And I'm gonna start bringing this together with shifting the focus a little bit here. Um, here we are, we're coming not only to the end of a supposedly Christian age in some ways, although they'll deny that one, an astrological age, a Mayan age, the Kali Yuga, the great year of Hinduism, many different, not only are we going into another age, we're rebooting a lot of the ages at one time. Not only of all these different philosophies, but entire sets of 20, 2,150 uh, 5,125, 26,000, 144,000, a lot of these, 144,000, hmm, that's a, that's a number from Revelation. 
And of course, seven what have to be cleansed? Seven churches. The word for church in Aramaic is haikla, which is the same word Yeshua used when he pointed at his body. Haya means energy. And la means something gathered in one place, a gathering of energy. You could say church, or you could say spinning energies, cleansed, seven deadly sins. Seven demons being cast out. Okay, never mind. But you're not picking it up. No, I know you are. I know, I'm kidding. Just, <sighs> but what happens is when you come to the end of something like that, Yeshua said, I am with you even unto the end of time. Interesting that in Aramaic, the first three words in Matthew 28, 20 are ina, amkun, ena. Ina means I, okay? Amkun means one with, fused with, united with. And then the next word is ina again, which means I, not I am one with you, I am one with I. In the words of St. Francis of Assisi, what you are looking for is what is looking. That consciousness that you seek witnessing is not about going out and bowling people over with your ideologies and beating them down with a book. It's being what you're talking about. It's living it. It's being in that essence. It's being Christaya, that highest awareness that is absolutely limitless, that has no beginning and no ending. But the way it feels when that system gets to the point of entropy, when you try to, you're begging for something to go faster, faster, and faster. And here we are, we're down to this sort of end of time. You go to the end of that phrase, Matthew 28, 20, what he actually says is the end of time, end of the age, l'shulame da alma. It's interesting, you go forward, what he actually says is, I am one with I in every now moment in the anticipation of the ceasing of your concept or conception or ideology of time. When Elohim would create in the Old Testament, he would say, and it was what? He would create and say, and it was good. That word tuv in Hebrew and Aramaic actually means ripe. When's the only moment in time you can judge fruit as being ripe? Can you look at a green banana and today and say Wednesday morning, 10 a.m., it'll be perfectly ripe? No, it only happens when. When you're in the moment, which is now. When's the end of time? It's now. When you're fully present in this moment, whether it be meditation, whether you're driving and you've got the right music on in the car and you're fully present, or you're holding a baby in the first 20 minutes of life, it's when you're fully present now. And the more of us that come fully present into the now, that law of entropy will start to break itself down and the willingness goes into the system and we can bump up to a higher level. But if you're complaining about everything falling apart, that can't happen, can it? So I was asked at a Unity Church in Texas about a year and a half ago, a very pretty... Um, well-known minister within the unity movement, she's like, Dale, what do you see? And I see, well, it's worse than anything you can imagine. And she didn't like it. Um, and it's funny, is it worse than anything you can imagine right now? Yes. And here's the funny thing. We're very disconnected in the U.S. Do you actually realize what's happening in Syria? Do you realize that modern Assyrian is a form of Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke? Do you realize that Jubab Baka, uh, or... Jubad and Baka and Malula in the Kurdistan mountains of Syria are still speaking the closest known dialect to what Jesus spoke on the planet. And I will say this, I'm plugged into main, or mainline news organizations that come directly, not shaded through all of our United States news systems. And if you knew what was going on there, you wouldn't believe it. And yet at the same time, it's over there. So everything's hunky-dory here, but you're feeling it too because it's one singular system. There is no inside and outside. There is no here and there. And it's almost like, the way I liken it, is almost like there's this consciousness rag that's being twisted right now. And it's being twisted and it's being twisted and it's being twisted and curled and curled and curled. But isn't that what we've been asking for? Haven't we been asking for awakening? Haven't we been asking for going through that sacred tunnel? That fractal that's gonna kind of I don't want to say chew us up and spit us out. That's not quite what you're asking for. But that, that experience of something that is basically coming through and collapsing back down upon itself and going in. Is that my Bible? Yes. Why is it there? It's been the night here. Oh, cool. I'm sorry. Like right in the middle. Is that my Bible? The 1611 King James. Ooh. Ooh. Original edition. 
original, original, yeah, it's the original edition. That's the, uh, it's very old. It doesn't look old, but um, it's exactly what's happening right now. We're coming down and we're into a filtering point. And we've got this thing that's, what is that actually doing? We're all sort of, here I am walking way up here, and we're all up in this system for a long time, so completely disconnected. We're all these different human beings and all these different cultures and all these different countries, but what's happening? Where are we being pulled? Together. We're being pulled together. And we get pulled together, what we start to do is, everybody loves happiness, everybody loves family, but what happens is when you start getting pulled together, you start seeing everybody else's stuff closer. You don't see your own anymore, you just see theirs. And everything's being squeezed down. If there's ever been a time for us to come together, it's right now. And, excuse me, cut the crap. The BS. Belief systems. I don't know what you were thinking when I said that, but... <laughs> but, I mean, if ever. And I, and I want to give you a little piece. I was awakened in the night um, just about two months ago, three months ago, in the middle of the night. And it happens a lot where I get something in the middle of the night, I scribble it down, and I wake up the next morning, and it looks like a doctor's prescription. Uh, and I have no idea what it says. But this time, it was really clear. And it said this. Light is not the absence of darkness. It is the inclusion of darkness, which, when fully known, is light. What is enlightenment if not the realization that something was once in darkness? From my friend Justice Barrymore, the second one. What happens when you go closer to the sun, the light of the sun? You burn. What happens when you go closer to the light of God? You burn. Because nothing can come into that presence except that presence that only knows itself. And if you're suffering and if everything's falling apart, it's because you are not open. You're not letting what needs to happen, happen. In the ancient Aramaic teachings of Jesus, there is no such thing as the fire of hell. There is only the light of God. The hell that he was talking about was Gehenna, the city trash dump. <laughs> Gehenna was not a place you die in, in eternal brimstone and fire, okay? That was Greek mythology, and it got nailed in with Dante's passion play, and specifically the Inferno. Now, here's the thing. Yeshua said, those that are near to me are near to the fire. Those that are far from me are far from the kingdom. That fire, that light, that presence is everywhere present, and it's in every single, sing every single solitary one of us, and yet there is no solitary one of us. There's only one. It's all happening right now. Just be open. How do you be open? I'll give you three keys to bring this to a close. And they're actually the first three Aramaic Beatitudes. And I'm not going to talk about why they're different from the ones that you know because we don't have time. But breathe, feel what you're feeling, and let it flow. Let it pass through the system. Breathe, feel it, let it pass. Because your resistance creates your suffering. And does it work to not think about it? Okay, don't think about Michael Jackson. Don't think about Michael Jackson. No Michael Jackson, no Michael Jackson, no Michael Jackson. Who are you not thinking about? It doesn't work. And the more you try not to think about that incessant, infernal Justin Bieber song that your daughter plays over and over and over, baby, 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 oh. The more you try not to, the more you will break down and suffer. I'm sorry, Justin, but I was just trying to make a point. So I'm going to leave you with this one quote. And this quote is from a great book, uh, and a truly incredible book, from one of the leaders of the Evolver movement. It's a guy named Jonathan Tollett Phillips. Um, I've worked with him a couple times in the last few months. Jonathan, um, the book's called The Electric Jesus. Jonathan is really a spearhead of what seems like a new culture, but it's been a culture that's been there, especially in the youth that's coming, and they're just not interested in the religions. They're not interested in the labels. They're not interested in the boxes. They just want to be open, and they want to be real, okay? And it's amazing that just, I'm not going to cry. I'm not, don't think about crying. <laughs> just about two and a half months ago, Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict came out and said the entire Christian philosophy boils down to one single word, and it's the Aramaic word, which means be 
open. Benedict said that. And I read this to you from Jonathan. This is from the electric Jesus. Why build entirely new systems for connecting to Christ consciousness when the institutions, whether Methodist or Lutheran or Baptist, have already been created? Today, these religions are like the dry canals that the Apocalypse of Peter, which is one of those no-no gospels, the Apocalypse of Peter you weren't allowed to read, that the Apocalypse of Peter referred to. To incorporate Christ consciousness, they would have to give up their addiction to dominating worshipers. I am not talking about (laughs) y'all. Lest I never be invited back again. Address the evolution of the spirit and infuse the essence of the mysteries into their hollow edifices. Many popular Eastern disciplines today have us turning away from the world around us, meditating on our navels. What I will add to that is the Western perception of Eastern ideas, I would have to say. But Christ wasn't only a yogi, he was an activist, carrying his message to those who most needed it. Our ailing planet needs spiritual warriors, ones capable of standing up to the Western materialism machine so that we can create sustainable societies that care for their citizens, harmonize with the cycles of nature, and receive and honor the vast healing light that quietly connects us all. In the words of the Lakota, let the wind blow through you. And there's also another beautiful word in the Lakota, which is the word unchi isi api. Unchi isi api is a word that is similar to the third beatitude, which is not meek as in blessed are the doormats, but absolute humility. The word humility comes from the Latin root humus, which is not a Middle Eastern chickpea dip (laughs) that is great with veggies and pita bread, but rather humus means from or into the fertile earth because you are the fertile earth and you don't inherit the earth, you are the earth. In the words of Thomas Berry, the earth was once molten lava and now it is singing operas. Thank you for your time. Thank you.